Welcome to this uh, classes of Introduction to Astronomy. I am uh, Sebastian Foucault from the National Taiwan Normal University, Department of Earth Sciences. So I'm an astronomer and specialize in extragalactic astronomy, it means study of galaxies. During those uh, 14 weeks of lecture, uh, we'll uh, introduce you to the various concepts of astronomy. So this is the syllabus we'll go through those 14 weeks. It's splitted in actually four big sections. The first section that we'll start today is all about uh, techniques in astronomy. Well, that's a storm. How to uh, find uh, its way on the night and uh, the properties of light. So I'll, I'll insist a lot on that, but astronomy it relies only on uh, observation through light of very distant objects. This is the only way we can observe stars, planets, and galaxies, and the whole universe. It's through light. So the properties of light are extremely important thing for astronomers. And I'll spend a bit of time talking about telescopes. Then we'll start astronomy uh, uh, as such, astrophysics as, as such, with the uh, exploration of the solar system. So we'll start with Earth. Earth is a planet. So it's the planet we are living, it's a very important planet for us, but it's just a planet. It's a, a very interesting to uh, uh, study Earth to give some light on other planets. Then we look at our moon, which is a very peculiar object too. Then we look at uh, rocky planets, giant planets, and we come up with some scenario of how the solar system was formed. And then this uh, third section will be about uh, stars and planets outside our solar system. So once again, we start with the Sun. The Sun is just a star, okay? It's a very important star for us, living on Earth. It's the star that is bringing us light and energy, but it's just a star like many, many other stars you can see during the night. So then we'll go and, and describe the properties of those stars and how the stars evolve, where, how they are formed, and how they die. Because like anything in the universe, universe itself actually, stars have a lifetime. They are born, they live, and they die, exactly like anything else. Then we'll look of, on the properties of planets that are around other stars. So the first, the second part of, of, of this syllabus will describe the solar system, planets around our sun, and here, at the end of uh, lecture 12, during the lecture 12, we describe planets that are uh, orbiting around other suns. And then the last two lectures will be dedicated to galaxies and the properties of our, our universe itself. So this is what I'm working on, but these the concepts here are very difficult. That's why we spend uh, so little time on this. So today, I'm going to start with how do we observe the universe. So how we can find our way on the night. So you all have been curious, that's probably why you're here today, you all have been curious about uh, the stars outside and it started even from a very long time. People always have been curious to understand what were those tiny dots that were there during the nights. So the first thing that we have done, actually Greeks and Egyptians and Mayans have done, is to do a catalog of it. And to catalog things, you have to be able to spot them very uh, precisely on the sky. So even nowadays, professional astronomers, when they observe a, an object, a particular object, a given star or a given galaxy, they need to be able to find it again and again and again, to observe it again. So this is what we'll do today. We'll describe the way how we can uh, find objects in our sky. So we'll start with where we are. You know, we always have seen those maps in the subway or in the city with a red dot telling you where you are. This is more or less where I would like to start. And then there's something that is very important in astronomy as well, is how we're measuring time. Time is an essential effect on our life. So by time year, I will, I will tell you how you measure days, how you measure seasons, months, how do we measure years. So how we came up with all those concepts. And then. Uh, I will describe what constellations are. So probably just something you're pretty familiar with. So 
what we have done in the past is take several stars, connect them together, it gives you a geometric form, and you relate it to a very nice story. This is what we call the constellations. And I mean, in introduce you to the concepts of celestial sphere. What is the ecliptic? The ecliptic is actually the path on the sun in our sky, and how we define seasons, and then at the end, and we'll come back a bit more next lecture, uh, uh, how we define a coordinate system to spot very accurately an object in the sky. Something that you will have to remember, especially when we start uh, the last few lectures, when we start talking about the universe and the galaxies, is that the lights travel at a finite speed. It takes time for it to travel distances. So uh, the speed of light is a constant. The speed of light is defined. It's 300,000 kilometers per second. So it takes time for the uh, light to come from an object that is distant to us. And if this object is very distant, that means more than 300,000 kilometers, then it will take more than a second to come. So here we have seen a lightning. The sun is very few, few seconds after. This is a good example. The lightning is almost immediate for us because it's a stroke in the, in the sky on, on the earth and producing the sound. So for us, the light is immediate, but the sound is a bit uh, slower, so it came us for uh, a bit later. Well, for a very distant object, the light is not even immediate anymore. So for instance, uh, if we take the example of the moon, the moon is uh, around 380,000 kilometers away from us. That means it takes a bit more than one second for the light to travel from the moon to us. And if we take the case of the sun, for instance, the sun is eight minutes at the speed of light away from us. That means that if I had a way to switch off the sun immediately, instantly, then we will see it happening only eight minutes later. If you take the example of Sirius, which is the brightest star in our sky, northern sky, it takes eight years of the for the light to travel from Sirius to here. So same thing, if I switch off immediately Sirius, then I will see it disappearing only in eight years. Uh, the Orion Nebulae, for instance, which is in the, the constellation of Orion, it takes 1,500 years for the light to reach us. And the closest galaxy, which is the Andromeda galaxy, light takes 3 million years to reach us. So we see uh, Andromeda the way it was 3 million years ago. We come back on those concepts when we talk about galaxies, because it's make more important, but already for stars, you see, it takes several years for light to come from stars to us. So where are we? So we'll see that again at the end of the series of lecture when we talk about galaxy. This is a, a representation of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So you're probably familiar with the Milky Way. If you're observing the sky very, during a very dark night, you will see this slight path crossing the sky, which is actually a very dense amount of stars making this Milky Way in the sky. This is our own galaxy. So it's actually this galaxy, and you see through the age, but this galaxy with spiral lines. We'll come back on all those notions later. And the sun is more or less here. So this is where the center of the galaxy here is, and this is where the sun is. And this is very important. Remember that the sun is a star in a galaxy that is composed of billions of stars, very similar to the sun, and there are billions of billions of galaxies outside. So we're not very in peculiar place at all. Actually, we are not in any peculiar place at all. The conditions for us to be here are very peculiar, but where we are is not very uh, bizarre. It's just a very common place, very common feature. It's a very common type of galaxy, and we're living around a very common type of stars. So for the question is, are we alone out there? The answer is probably not. So the problem is, uh, distances are so big that even if we are not alone, communication is almost impossible. So if you look at the scale of the universe, how the universe is big, then you start to understand why it's so difficult for us to be able to reach other stars or to reach other planets. So even the nearby planets, by that I mean in our solar system, are uh, very distant compared to normal human scales. For instance, as a Voyager, which was the first probe sent, one of the first probes sent across our solar system to explore the age of it, it took it several decades, actually, around 20 years to reach Neptune compared to when, when it was launched. And if you let it travel at the speed at which it's traveling currently, it will take thousand 
100,000 years for it to reach uh, Alpha Century, which is the closest star. So it took 20, 20 years to reach the age of our solar system, and it will take 100,000 years for it to reach Alpha Century. And if you look at the scale of galaxies, like the Milky Way, we're talking about, I don't even know how, many, how we call that number, but it's like one million of million stars, minimum. And the universe contains almost an infinite number of galaxies, like something like one million billion of galaxies. So we're talking about something that is very, very big, okay? So even the closest stars are very, very far away. So even if one planet have a sustained life somewhere, communicating with it is extremely, extremely difficult given the distances. And the chances that the planet is habitable is very, very small. So let's go back on Earth, because this is something that we're more familiar with. And let's start describing how we measure time on our Earth. So it's very important not only for astronomers, this is actually how astronomy starts really. It's very important for uh, landscaping or for agriculture, for instance. You want to know when the winter starts, you want to know when the cold season starts, you want to know when you want to plant your seed for it to grow. So having an accurate measurement with, uh, throughout the year is uh, very important for uh, many uh, human activities. So let's start with the basic. Earth is rotating on its axis. So uh, if you don't know that yet, it's probably time to learn it. The sun is not rotating around the earth, the earth is rotating around the sun. And the fact that the sun is having a path through the day in our sky is just coming from the fact that earth is rotating on its axis, all right? So this is a picture from the earth, okay? This is the axis of rotation, so here we have North and South America, Antarctica here, and the uh, Earth is turning uh, on its own axis from uh, west to east. And this rotation is differential. That means the closer you are to the equator, the faster you're turning. So at the North Pole, of course, you're not rotating around the uh, axis, so you're not moving. And at the equator, you're turning at a speed around 1,650 km per hour compared to the center on the disk. So, if you have a camera, it's programmable, you can do that kind of experiment. You just put it on a fixed position. So, in that case, you point towards a given part of the sky. This one is peculiar. This is the Solaris star. And you just let your camera expose for a very long time. In that case, it's probably exposing for three or four hours. And what you will see is all those star trails. So, what's happening is while the Earth is turning on its axis, all the stars that are in the background are not moving. So what you see is that it's just the rotation, the effect of rotation of the Earth around its axis. And here, where Polaris is, is just the uh, direction towards which the axis of rotation of Earth is pointing to. So the direction of our axis of rotation. And as a result, we see all the stars turning around this point. So here, this is Mauna Kea, which is an observatory a mountain in Hawaii, where the main part of the observatories are. And so this is a picture taken from Hawaii. So due to the rotation of the Earth on its axis, the sky appears to ro rotate east to west uh, about the celestial poles, because Earth is actually rotating west to east. We know the period of rotation, uh, more or less, it's 24 hours. This is what we call a day, so the time for the day is just the time for Earth to do a complete turn around its own axis. And actually, I'll come back on that in a second. Things are a bit more complicated than that. We have several ways of measuring the uh, period of rotation. So we have what we call the sidereal day. It's how long it takes for a given star in the sky to come back to the same place. And it's actually taking 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. But by definition, the solar day, that means the time between having the sun above our head and it again the day after, is taking 24 hours. So why there is a difference between those two uh, notions of day? I told you already, the star rotates in a, uh, around the North Star, that is called Polaris. So what is this difference between solar and sidereal day? So let's try to think about it a bit uh, in details. So this is the sun, okay, and the Earth is turning around the sun. So the path of the Earth is turning around the sun, it's taking a year, we'll come back on that in a minute, and the day is defined as 
for how long it takes for the Earth to turn around its own axis. So, for instance, we are here in A, how long it will take for A to come back on the same point. So if we compare two stars that are very far away on the background, so very distant stars are around the wall over there, okay? So you take one star as a reference, you see that it took you one tour from here to here to see it at the same place, okay? But if you want to look back at the sun, you need just a little extra leap to face the sun exactly at the same place. So this is why you have a difference between solar and sidereal day. For a star that is in the background, okay, it will take someone on a, the point A 23 hours and 50 min 56 minutes to see it at the same place. But to look directly at the sun, we need extra four minutes. This is the same thing again. You have the sun here, you have the stars, in that case it's in the other direction, away from us. And this is where you are at the start, you look at the sun and at the star in the same direction. To look back at the star, it takes you 23 hours and 56 minutes, but you need a little extra bit to, or to face the sun again, four minutes more. So, if I, I'm uh, staying on the same point, okay, I'm turning on, around myself, I just do one tour, but if at the same time I'm turning around you, that's the same way that the Earth is turning around the Sun, okay, let's do that, I turn, okay, so to face back the background wall, I've done this full tour, okay, which is one tour for me, but to face you again over there, I need to do a little extra bit. And this little extra bit is those four minutes. So why four minutes? Well, that's quite easy to calculate actually. So here, once again, we have the same example. The sun is here, then the distance is over there. You are at that point, it takes you one tour to face again the distance star. And you need just this little extra bit to face the sun. So the idea is because the uh, rotation of Earth around the sun is uh, around 365 days, you need to turn 360 degrees, okay? So that means that you or, or, or have around one degree per day. So now you look at uh, how much it's in minutes. So one degree is 24 hours times 60 minutes divided by 360 degrees. That corresponds to four minutes a day. So actually the stars rise four minutes earlier each day. So if you multiply by months, that's two hours per month. Okay? We have a little bit the difference between those two definitions. It takes a little bit more for the Earth to face the Sun for four minutes more. So we have different Earth days, actually. So the common knowledge is this one, the mean solar day, it's 24 hours. But actually, if you look relatively to background stars, you have what we call the sidereal day, which is 23 hours and 56 minutes and four seconds. And um, don't get confused also with the apparent solar day, because this uh, depends where you are on Earth. You know that if you go uh, toward the equator, you almost have 12 hours of daylight per day. But when you go up north, you have less and less. So for instance, it depends on the seasons as well. So for instance, around this period where I was living before in, in the United Kingdom, in England, which is quite up north compared to Taiwan, uh, then we had very long evenings with daylights. Uh, at the 21st of June, you can have uh, daylight up to around 10 o'clock in the evening. On the opposite, during winters, at 3 in the afternoon or 4 in the afternoon, it was already dark. It's a little different. So let's talk about month now. And you probably know that months are based on actually the orbits of the moon around the Earth. So this is the orbits of the moon around the Earth. Here we have the sun, here we have the Earth, and the moon is orbiting around the Earth. We'll see that a bit, le a bit later when we talk about Earth, moon, and eclipse, but the moon is not exactly in the same plan than the rotation of Earth around the sun. We'll come back on that later. And the, the average distance between the Moon and the Earth is around 380,000 kilometers. Actually, the uh, orbit of the Moon around the Earth is not exactly a circle. It's a little bit elongated. Sometimes it's a bit further at the apogee. It's around 406,000 kilometers. And sometimes it's a bit closer. It's called the perigee. It's around 368,000 kilometers, but in average, it's 380,000 kilometers. 
And something that you are very familiar with is the moon half phases. We'll come back on that when we talk about the moon in a few lectures. So remember, you have the full moon when it's all bright. And then on the opposite, you have the new moon when it's all dark. And you have different craters in the picture. So in the case of the moon, the moon's rotations will match the orbit. The sidereal rotation is the same as the sidereal orbital period. That means the moon is doing a full tour around the Earth in 27.3 days. Okay, so this is the Earth and the moon, the sun is over there, and the time for the moon to do a full tour is 27.3 days. And I will see that again when we look at the, at the moon in detail, but uh, there is a very interesting properties of the moon is that the moon is always showing the same face. Whenever you look at the moon, you always see it looking like that. Wherever you are on Earth and whenever you're looking at it. And actually, we'll see that in details. It's coming from tidal forces that are maintaining the moon to show us always the same face. So, this is the Earth, this is the moon, and while the moon is turning around the Earth, it's turning on its own axis at the same time, and it's synchronized with its rotation around the Earth. So the moon is always showing the same face toward the Earth. Okay, um, we have the same effect actually on the rotation of the moon that we have for the uh, rotation of the Earth and the Sun. So this uh, difference between uh, sidereal months and synodic months. Remember for the Earth, the Earth takes four extra minutes to uh, come from facing stars in the background to face the Sun. We have similar problem with the moon. The position of the moon as defined compared to the background stars, for the moon to come back exactly at the same place, it takes 27.3 days. But if we count the number of days between a new moon and another new moon, it's called a synodic period, and it's actually taking a bit more time. It's taking 29.53 days. So here I have the sketch here, showing you the sun, the earth, and the moon. Okay. So it, this is the full moon here, in that case, the sun is here, the earth is here, and the moon is there. And it takes around 27.3 days for the moon to come back to the same place as compared to a distant star. So for a moon to do a full tour as compared of the distant star is taking 27.3 days. But to come back to the full moon again, that means to have the three bodies completely aligned again, it's taking 29.5 days. So exactly that for the day, we have different definition for the uh, month. The sidereal month is 27 days, and the synodic month 29.5 days. And actually, on Earth, we use usually this kind of definition. We don't care about actually the sidereal month. We don't care about the position of the moon as compared to the stars. What we want to know is when is the new moon. So our months are usually based on the synodic definition. So now let's go to the last definition of time, probably the most important one, is the year. So the year is defined as the time for the Earth to do a full rotation around the Sun. So let's have a look at uh, the uh, orbit of Earth and the Sun in detail. Once again, exactly like for the Moon's orbit around the Earth, the Earth orbits around the Sun is not a perfect uh, circle. It's actually slightly elongated. It's called an ellipse. We'll come back on that when we talk about planets in more details. That means that the Earth is sometimes closer and sometimes further from the Sun. So the periapis, when it's closer to the Sun, is around 147 million kilometer, and the apoapis is when the Earth is further from the Sun, is around 152 million kilometer. And uh, this rotation evolves with time, so the periapis happen around the 3rd of January, then the uh, Poapis happen around the 3rd of July. Come back on those solstice definitions in a minute. So what is the sidereal year? Once again, the same definition. The time that takes Earth to do a full tour around the Sun as compared to the background stars. So the sidereal year is 365.256363 mean solar days. So this is one problem, you see. It's not the wrong number. You need a bit more days to do a full tour, a bit more than a given number of days. So you need 365 and a quarter of day to do a full tour. We have other definitions. Anomalistic year, 
which is around 365, 25, 9, 6, 3, 5 uh, mean solar days, is defined as the time to come from perihelion to perihelion, which is slightly more than the sidereal day. And we also have the tropical year, which is defined from equinox to equinox. So this is related to the seasons. We'll come back on that a bit later. So the tropical year is the one actually that we care about. It's you want to know uh, what happened from one season to an, another season. So you want to know when you have to plant your seed. So when is the 21st of March? You want to know when the winter is starting or when the spring is starting. And so this is defined as the tropical year. And actually you will realize that the tropical year is 20 minutes shorter than the sidereal year. So somehow our seasons won't be synchronized with the position of the sun in the background stars uh, on the, with a period of 72 years. and Mayans and uh, all the primitive uh, uh, civilization had a calendar based on 365 days, okay? It doesn't take long to count how many days it needs to do a year. Uh, the problem is, for the Egyptians, is that every day, for one day every four years, because it's not 365, but it's 365.25, so they are a shift in the equinox that the 21st of March is changing by every four years which is a problem. That means that after a century, you have 25 days. That means that the summer starting 25 days later, after 100 years, which is, can be a big problem for agriculture. You can imagine for the empire in Egypt uh, run for f uh, thousands of years, after thousands of years, you have the summer in the winter and the winter in the summer. It doesn't work. So the Greeks and the Romans realized that very rapidly. And Julius Caesar, which was one of the uh, famous Roman leader, introduced the leap years in 50 before Christ. That means every four years, you add one day in the calendar, which is actually what happens even today, nowadays. Remember, every uh, four years, so this was the case in 2012, we have a 29th of February. Okay, 2013, 14, and 15 we want, and again, 2016, we'll have a 29th of February. So we have a leap year, that means a 360 days year every four years. And uh, this is what we call the Julian year, called Julius Caesar, which is composed of 365.25 million solar days. Okay, so this is what was used as a calendar up to the end of the 16th century. However, over periods of centuries, the occurrence was still shifting. Remember the definition a bit less than 365.25. It's actually 365.24 something. So every now and then, actually, we had another shift and people were worried about several million years how, how it will happen. So uh, the Pope Gregory XIII modified the leap years to account for this. So nowadays we're using what we call the Gregorian year. That means 365.2425. What does that mean? That means that actually every century we don't have a leap year. So if you look back in your calendar in year 2000, there were no leap year. Every 100 years there is no leap year. So if you do the count, you will see that this allows us to correct from this number to that number. Every 100 years we don't have a leap year. So 2000 has no leap year, what it should have, according to the uh, Julian calendar. So, in a few words, is we need a leap year because the number of time required of rotation of the Earth on its axis to make up a year is a bit more than the, uh, than the uh, round number. Right, so let's go down to a very simple question. What time is it? And actually, you know that, and the answer uh, depends where you are on Earth. The time now here is actually not the same time that it's back in France for me. So if I call my parents now, they probably will hate me because it's the middle of the night for them. 
So we came up to account from this uh, effect of time of hours, we came up with the ideas of time zones. So the idea behind the time zones is to ensure that noon is really noon. That means that the sun is at the top of the sky, above our head. So to avoid confusion limit, we need a zero point. So we use the universal time UT, which is the time at the meridian in Greenwich, which is in England, actually, it's a United Kingdom. So for instance, for Taiwan, the universal time is the time in time one minus eight hours. So we uh, split the Earth in different time zones. So from uh, minus 12 to plus 12. So this is the Greenwich Meridian that is going through England, UK. And this is the equator here. And so each colors correspond to uh, a different time zone. So you know, for instance, that in the US, you have four time zones crossing the US. So you have East Coast and West Coast time, which is four hours apart, which is not a system that, for instance, has been adopted for uh, China. So actually, uh, in, in Nepal, you are exactly at the same time as in Beijing, which is a bit ridiculous because there are two hours difference. So if you have two hours, noon in Nepal is actually in, two in the afternoon. But uh, uh, noon in Nepal is actually happening in 10 in the morning for them. Anyway. Uh, so we define all those time zones to ensure that the sun is at the highest point approximately at noon in the middle of the time zone. So time is something very important, but one of the first things for which astronomy was used was actually to, uh, or for orientation. So imagine uh, back in the past when we didn't have GPS, no iPhone, okay? So you didn't know exactly where the direction. You, know, you knew where the north is, because the north, north magnetic pole, and you could, uh, during the day, know where the north, east, and west, according to the position of the sun. But when the sun was set during the night, how you do that? And usually navigation was used for people that were on boats. So when you're in the middle of the ocean, you don't have any reference point at all during the night on your horizon, how do you know that you're keeping the cape in the right direction? So one of the first things that people have done is use stars to describe their orientation and also uh, as an account of time. So I told you, the stars are, ch are changing with time around uh, during the night, so uh, people were using that as a clock as well. And well, they did pretty well. We have an example of, of ancient maps where people, just by using very simple calculation according to the position of the stars during the night and the position of the sun during the day, managed to map out uh, here, this is the Mediterranean Sea in Europe and Northern Africa, and pretty accurately. And even for big distances, like here, this is the uh, Indian Ocean. Okay, so here we have Arabia, there's Africa, Madagascar is over there. Here you have India, so Taiwan is probably around there. This is uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka. Um, so people, just by using those uh, very uh, simple way of measuring distances, that means just position of stars in the sky, manage to draw very accurate maps. And here distances are massive. When you have to cross that, it's a, it's a very long journey. So the first use of astronomy was actually for navigation, one of the main uses. So you need to be able to spot very accurately stars in the sky. So that's how you have to define what you call set of stone points. That means you need to be able to define where the north is, for instance. So we can use uh, a very simple way. You know, once again, Earth is rotating around its axis toward a given direction, and this direction indicating the north for us. So what you have to do is to look for that star, which is called Polaris. So in the north uh, hemisphere, what you can do is use, for instance, a very bright constellation, very easy to spot in the North Pole, that is visible throughout all the seasons, which is called Ursa Major, or uh, the Great Deep, or the Great Bear. So it's very easy, it looks like a, a deep, actually, okay, a pan. The handle here, and then the, 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 the pan here. And there is its little sister, that is look more or less the same, but upside down. It's called Ursa Minor. And Polaris is actually part of the constellation Ursa Minor. So the trick is to use the distances between those two stars, and you do six, uh, five times, and you spot out Polaris through Ursa Minor. So we have a very easy way to spot out where the uh, northern celestial pole is in the northern hemisphere. 
for the Southern Hemisphere, it's a bit more complicated because there are no star, actually, where the actual source pole is. But one way of doing it is to use what we call the Southern Cross, which is the brightest, more or less, one of the brightest uh, constellations in, in the Southern sky. So you take the Southern Cross and uh, you take the distance between those two stars and you do it six times and you can more or less where the source pole is. So, according to this, you know where the north is. Well, when you know the north, where the north is, you know where the west, east, and south are. So it's pretty easy. But uh, you have more star than one star, and actually, uh, you can do far more than just pointing up the north. I told you, uh, you can use it as a chronometer and a very, very accurate way of mapping your position. If you know very well the sky, you should be able, from any place on the Earth, to know where you are very accurately, actually. It's a very, very good mapping. And that's what people have done for a very long time. And we rely around 5,000 stars. There are around 5,000 stars visible with naked eye from Earth. And 3,500 of them are seen in the Northern Hemisphere. While there are less, only 1,500 seen from the Northern Hemisphere, it's because we have this Milky Way which is very bright, actually, in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's very faint in the Northern Hemisphere, but if you go to the south, you'll see the Milky Way is extremely bright. So part of the sky is covered by the Milky Way, so you have less stars to rely on. So the best way, actually, to remember uh, those stars is to group them into constellations. You don't want to be able to point one star alone. What you do, usually, is you look for geometric forms in the sky on the celestial sphere, and we group them together, and you can link into a story. So the main part of those constellations, those drawings in the sky, are related in the Northern Hemisphere to uh, Greek and Roman uh, mythology. But uh, nowadays, we have defined officially 88 constellations as determined by the International Astronomy Union. So this is a very defined catalog of constellations. Everyone is using the same. And uh, the names of those uh, constellations range from the mythological names uh, in mainly in the Northern Hemisphere, like Perseus, Cassiope, or Orion. And uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, mainly technical, like the airplane, the compass, etc. Why? Because uh, constellations have been named very lately in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, here we have, for instance, the example of Orion. Here, those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stars. Uh, composing the Orion. Uh, so this is actually what we call the asterism, this geometric form, and the constellation is defined as an area of the sky here in lighted gray. So next to it you have Gemini, Riga, Taurus, Lepus, Canis Major, etc., etc. This is a very nice picture of Orion here. So you have two very bright stars on Orion, and Orion is very easy to spot thanks to those three stars that are uh, almost perfectly aligned, very close one to the other. And Orion is not an hemisphere, is, is visible mainly during the winter, but it's very easy to spot, so usually it's easy. And here you have uh, Betelgeuse and Rigel, for instance. And this is a picture taken by uh, one of my graduate students, so Chen Quan, here, is uh, showing us Orion. So this is once again the, the constellation with Betelgeuse, the three, the belt here, and here Regal. And why he's doing this? It's because Orion is called the Great Hunter. It's actually coming from the Greek mythology. According to the Greek mythology, Orion was a hunter that killed a lion. It was a very, very famous hunter. He was so good that uh, they named a constellation after him. So here we have his belt, which is the three stars. Actually, this object here is uh, Orion Nebulae. We'll see that in the, in the future when we talk about nebulae. It's, a very, it's almost able to spot it by naked eye. So a, this is actually, in that case, an explosion of the star that happened in the past. This is a remaining of a, a star that explodes. So here, it composed the sword of Orion. And here, this is the torso of it. And actually, the complete picture, you have an arm here where he's having a sword or sometimes a uh, a bow, that's what uh, Chen Quan was showing before. So this is how it looks like, this is how people imagine it looks like, and this is how it really looks like. Because those things are just projection on the sky. They're actually, those stars are not linked together in reality. They're not forming this geometric form in reality. Here, this is Earth, 
this is how it looks, the constellation, how it looks on the sky, on that projection, but this is how the objects are. And actually they are at different distances, it's just a projection effect. It's exactly like you project a picture on a screen, but you don't know how distant those objects are. You all have seen those uh, little experiments with, with photography, you probably all have done that when you are standing like that with your hand here, and a friend of yours that is very far away is actually mimicking like he's exactly in your hand, and it looks very tiny, okay? So on the picture, it really looks like you are I mean, uh, having a little friend in your hand like that. But you know that in reality, it's just a projection effect. It's because your friend is very far away, and it looks uh, very tiny on, the hand of, uh, on your hand. Here we have the similar effect, is that in reality, those stars are different distances one uh, from us. They're not related in reality, but their position on the sky make it look like a, a given geometrical form. All right? So we'll come back on that a bit later, but remember that those stars are actually not linked together. Constellations is just a mapping made by men to remember where stars are on our sky. But uh, actually, this is not a reality. Constellation, uh, stars are not uh, physically linked in, within a constellation. So Orion again. Uh, Orion can be used also to spot other uh, bright stars like Sirius, Aldebaran, Procyon, etc., Castor and Pollux from Gemini. And these are the names of the main stars, uh, Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Regal and Safe. And this is the Orion Belt. And usually in, uh, we name stars after the constellation they belong to. And we name them with Greek alphabet from the brightest to the faintest. So for instance, the brightest star in the Orion constellation is Betelgeuse. So actually we call it Orion Alpha. And the second brightest is Regal. So we call it Orion Beta. And once again, constellations are extremely useful because it's easier to remember a geometric form on the sky than to remember exact position of every individual stars. So usually we use a constellation to spot very interesting objects. And this is the case, for instance, for, for spotting M31. So uh, M31, Andromeda Galaxy, is the constellation of Andromeda here. So that's Pegasus, and this is the Andromeda Galaxy. So once you know which constellation this galaxy belongs to, or this particular object you're interested, you just put on the constellation in the sky, and then you look for your object. So it's extremely interesting. So this is another example. This is the uh, asterisms, for instance. So the difference between constellation and asterisms is that, according to the IAU definition, the constellation corresponds to a, an area in the sky. Okay, so here, represented by red dots. While the asterisms correspond to the drawings of the constellation you remember. Okay? So asterisms are a simplified view of the constellation. And for instance here, if you look for that, this star cluster, the Coafinger, well, you look for the constellation of Vulpicula and uh, Coafinger, it will be over there. So this idea of asterism and constellation comes back to this uh, notion of what you call the celestial sphere. So the celestial sphere, is just the projection, the screen on which the stars are projected around us. This is our sky, and we define the celestial sphere as the projection of all the stars that can be at any distance, like I mentioned for Orion. Stars actually at like different distances, but they appear to be on the celestial sphere. So if you look back in the ancient times, people were thinking that actually the sky was just like a limited sphere around us with all the stars on it. Actually, we know now that stars are different distances away from us. But this celestial sphere, the notion of celestial sphere remains. This is the, this sphere, apparent sphere, on which the stars are lying on for us. Okay? And this is very useful for us because on that celestial sphere, we can draw all those constellations and spot the different objects we're interested in. So what we can do is define coordinates on this celestial sphere. So for instance, we know how to spot the North Celestial Pole. Okay, this is where Polaris is. And we can define some coordinates. And the way we're doing it is that we let the sphere rotate at the same time of the Earth. So we can consider that this Celestial Sphere is rotating with the rotation of Earth. That means that the position on this Celestial Sphere of stars is fixed with the rotation of Earth. So then we just have to graduate this sphere so for instance, here, from 0 degree to 60 degree, 
according to a given equator, the celestial equator, and then we can use coordinates on the sky exactly the way we always coordinate on the, on the Earth. So I'll come back on this notion in a minute. So on that celestial sphere that is rotating, we have a North Pole and a South Pole. The celestial sphere is rotating at the same way that the Earth is rotating. You project the Earth equator on it, so the celestial equator corresponds to the Earth equator. The North Celestial Pole corresponds to our North Pole, the South Celestial Pole to our South Pole. And then this celestial sphere is just the imaginary sphere that is surrounding the Earth, on which you can draw the picture of the stars, like Cassiopeia or Gemini, etc. So we have, for instance, the circumpolar constellations. So Polaris indicates the North Pole. So on the sphere, you will have several constellations that we will rotate with the sphere. So for instance, this is uh, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Perseus, Cassiopeia, Cepheus. So those constellations, we turn around the Polaris, Polaris star, at the same rate that the Earth is turning on its own axis. So we call them circumpolar constellations because they are very close to Polaris. So that means that those constellations are visible in North Pole on, throughout the year. You can always see them. But constellations that are, for instance, lower on the pole here, they will appear to be there in the winter and not summer, for instance. Okay, so now we have defined the celestial sphere, North Pole, Equator, South Pole. We have all those uh, constellations on the sky, so how we are observing them? Well, the first thing, very natural way you have to observe your sky, your local sky, is to define compared to yourself, right? So you are here, it's a dark night, you have your horizon over, over there, you have your zenith on top of you, okay? And you just have to define where the north is, where the south is, where the east is, and then you can define locally where you are, the position in your sky. So what we do usually is define a meridian. So the meridian is coming from a north to south through the zenith. Okay, this is your horizon here. So you have north, east, or west. And then what I can do is to take a coordinate in this sky. So what I do is I, I look compared to the horizon. So this is the north, and I'm telling you it's 20 degrees east, for instance. So on the horizon, I'm turning 20 degrees east. So this is what we call the azimuth. And then I just define a height in degrees from the, from the ground floor, from the horizon where the object is. This is called the altitude. And, and then I can spot my object very easily. So why are we using degrees? Because it's easier to define, because it's a circular. So it's easy, easier to define from zero to 180, and from zero to 360. So we define it in degrees. So with two coordinates, okay, azimuth and altitude, we have the position of an object in our local sky. But things are a bit more complicated. Because this is the celestial sphere, this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole, where we are, okay? And uh, we come back to all those no other notion, but you have the celestial equator here. So this is how the celestial sphere is as compared to the rotation of the Earth. Remember, the celestial sphere is actually defined compared to the Earth, with the celestial equator being corresponding to the equator of Earth, and the North South Pole corresponding to the axis of rotation of Earth. But you can be anywhere on this globe. So actually, you will see different parts of the celestial sphere according to where you are on the Earth. Which means that actually, your local sky depends on where you are. So this is here, for instance, the celestial sphere. Okay, so you have the equator, north celestial pole, south celestial pole. And if you are here in Taiwan, okay, your zenith, won't correspond to the North Celestial Pole, and your nephir won't correspond to the South Celestial Pole. So if in this local sky I define the position of an object, someone that is over there in Europe, compared to his local sky, won't have the same coordinates exactly. Let me explain that in more detail. If you look at this Altas system coordinates I just described, that means the horizon and the altitude, then locally I can very easily spot an object. Okay, so in that case, I have an object that is 130 degrees east, 
and 60 degrees altitude, and I know where it is on my local sky. But however, if I give these coordinates in my local sky to someone that is not on Earth, he use the same coordinates on his local sky, he won't point out in the same direction in the central sphere. In other words, if I use my local coordinates to spot an object and I give it to someone else elsewhere on Earth at a different time, he won't be able to spot my object because he will look in a totally different direction. So this system of coordinates are very natural for us, actually, because this is more or less the way we're using them on Earth. So horizon and altitude, this system definitions is uh, the same way we're defining on Earth. And actually, we can imagine that we could split the celestial sphere and coordinates the same way we are defining coordinates on Earth. So remember, on Earth, we have a North Pole, a South Pole, an equator, okay? So we have the prime meridian, so usually we use a Greenwich here as a coordinate uh, zero in latitude, and then the equator is coordinate zero in longitude. And for instance, if you want to spot Roma in that co system coordinates, you look at uh, longitude 72 degrees east and latitude 42 degrees north. So 72 degrees east and 42 degrees north. Same way, Miami, you look at uh, longitude 80 degrees west, so you take on the equator, 80 degrees uh, towards the west, and latitude 26 degrees north, and you spot on Miami. So on Earth, this is the way your GPS is working, actually, it gives you these kind of coordinates. So what we want to do is to use the exact same uh, system on our Celsius sphere. Okay, so I told you that your sky will be different where you are on the Earth. So actually, let's take from a very uh, simple cases. If you are physically in the North Pole, so you're exactly on the North Pole of Earth, so what you have above your head is the North Celestial Pole, okay? Exactly, in this particular case, this is the only case on Earth where actually your zenith correspond exactly to the North Celestial Pole. So what happened? In that case, you're here, your zenith is exactly the North Celestial Pole. Pole. So the stars seem to never rise or set because remember Polaris is over there so if you look at the track of stars uh, when the earth is rotating on its axis it will be completely co-circular of your zenith. So if you took the case of a star that is above the horizon it will never set. It will always be parallel to the horizon. So if you're exactly at the North Pole of Earth, then stars will never set, will never rise or set. They always travel parallel to the horizon. On the contrary, planets, moon, and the sun do rise and set. But stars in the background on the Celestial Sphere will really look to be parallel to the uh, horizon. On the other hand, if you look at sky and altitudes, so for instance, in the case of, of Taiwan, your zenith is actually tilted and doesn't correspond with the North Celestial Pole. So you're here, you look up, but actually the North Celestial Pole is toward the north. You're north, all right? So actually what will happen is that you will see the stars raising and, and falling in that case. It means that stars will turn around the pole like that, par parallel to the uh, Celestial Equator. Okay, so you will see throughout the night, stars will rise and set. Now, if you imagine that you are exactly on the equator, so what happens if you are exactly on the equator, then the North Celestial Pole will be at the horizon, okay? So your meridian, that means the line that is coming throughout your zenith, will correspond to the Celestial Equator. So what you will see is the stars throughout the night will shoot across the sky this way, perpendicular to you. While in the Northern Hemisphere, they will do something like that in the direction of the North Pole, and the Southern Hemisphere will do something like that in the direction of the South Pole. In the equator, it will just shoot perpendicularly to your horizon. So finally, I just said, uh, in the Southern uh, Latitudes, you won't see the North Celestial Pole because it will be below the horizon. So what you will see above the horizon is the Southern Celestial Pole, and you will see the star shooting in the other way around, from uh, west to east, around the South Celestial Pole. So, what about the Sun in all that? 
So you all know that actually the sun is crossing the sky, rising in the morning from the east and setting in the evening towards the west. So the path, exact path on the sun in our sky is very well defined. And the path of the sun on the celestial sphere is called the ecliptic. So you all probably know very well the ecliptic constellation. We call them the zodiac constellation. I will come back on that in a minute. But the ecliptic is just the prime path of the sun is the celestial sphere compared to the North Pole and South Pole. So in that sketch, we have the North Pole over there, the South Pole over there, okay? This is the uh, celestial equator in red, and the Sun is actually orbiting in around this ecliptic line around the celestial sphere. So this is just the projection on the Sun in the sky at different time of the year in the celestial sphere. And the Sun will cross in the sky on the celestial sphere different constellation throughout the year and those 12, actually 13, but those 12 constellations are called the zodiac constellation so for people that are interested in astrology this is the how they were defined initially but actually as you can see from here or from the previous picture so the ecliptic of the Sun on the celestial sphere doesn't correspond to the equator Actually, it doesn't correspond completely, and it has an angle here of around 23.5. You may notice that actually on the celestial sphere, the path of the sun on the celestial sphere doesn't really correspond actually to the celestial equator. There is a, a tilt, an angle here, which corresponds to around 23.5 degrees. So why is this the case? It's coming from the fact that actually the rotation axis of the Earth on itself is not perpendicular to the path of the Earth around the Sun. So here, the rotation of axis of the Earth is tilted by 23.5 degrees compared to its path around the Sun. So this is the Sun, this is the Earth, the Earth is turning around the Sun, but the axis of rotation of the Earth is not perpendicular compared to the uh, path of the Earth around the Sun, slightly tilted by 23 and a half degrees. This is actually the main reason why we have seasons. We'll still come back on that uh, in a second, okay? So this tilt of our rotation axis is actually creating the fact that the ecliptic plan is not exactly corresponding to the celestial equator. So the idea is this rotation of axis is fixed in space so that means that sometimes you look down onto the ecliptic and sometimes you are up to it. So I mentioned this actually axis is the main reason why we have seasons and you all know that we have seasons. So we have uh, winter, spring, summer and fall in that order. So this is just coming from the fact that the axis of rotation of the earth is not perpendicular compared to its plan of rotation around the sun. So what happened is that, for instance, in summer, in the northern hemisphere, you get more light than the southern hemisphere. And in winter, in the northern hemisphere, you get less light than the southern hemisphere. It means it's more hot during summer in the northern hemisphere and more cold in the winter. Another way of representing it is this way. So you have the axis of rotation of the Earth here. And this is the part of the Earth that is uh, lighted by the Sun. The Sun is in that direction, okay? So you see that in the northern hemisphere, so this is the equator, in the northern hemisphere, during the summer, you have more light coming on than in the southern hemisphere. It's, the distance between Earth and the Sun is uh, smaller than their distance compared to the Sun. So this is what happened during summer. So I mentioned at the very start that one of the reasons why we want to define month and time is to be able to follow seasons. Uh, four very important moments throughout the years are called the solstice and equinoxes. So we have two solstices, winter and summer, and two equinoxes, spring and fall, which is in behind. Imagine that this is the celestial sphere is here, so this is the Earth, this is the axe of rotation of the Earth, okay? So here you have, compared to the perpendicular uh, direction, compared to the uh, ecliptic plan, so this is the plan or width 
uh, the Earth is orbiting around the Sun. So this is the ecliptic plan here. And this is the celestial equator. Okay? So there is a tilt of 23.5 degrees. So when the celestial equator is crossing the ecliptic plan, this is what we call the vernal equinox, and when the Sun is at 23.5 degrees up toward the uh, east is the summer solstice, then when the ecliptic plan is crossing again, the celestial equator is called the uh, fall equinox, and then when the winter solstice is 23.5 degrees negative, this is what we call the winter solstice. I'll show you a bit more detail. So here, this is a way of representing it. So this is the North Celestial Pole. The South Celestial Pole is here. So this is where your zenith here is. Okay? So we have North, South, and East and West. And the water here, in that case, represents its perpendicular to the ecliptic plan. So uh, what we have here is what happened during the summer solstice. So this is our zenith. Okay? And this is the path of the sun in the sky. So in that case, the direction perpendicular to the ecliptic so this is the, the way the orbit of the Earth is going, in that way. So during the summer solstice, the uh, Sun is traveling very high up, very close to our zenith, in our, in our latitudes, in the sky. But if you look at the winter solstice, what will happen is the Sun will cross very low on the horizon. We travel very low on, on the horizon throughout the day. So in summer, it would be more hot than in winter. So if you come back to that, what will happen in summer solstice for someone that is in northern hemisphere, okay, so the path of the sky on the ecliptic would be very high up compared to where we are, but in the winter, the path of the sun in the sky would be very low. So actually you can plot that very easily. This is a composite image, is image taken by Anthony Ayomamitis in Greece. And what he has done is the same background, okay, this is the village here, and the same mountains, and he has taken picture of different sunsets at different times of the year. So what you see is that during the equinoxes, so spring, vernal equinox, and uh, fall equinox, the sun is setting in that direction, while in winter, it's setting over there, and in summer, it's setting over there. So during summer, it will travel higher in the sky, while in winter, it will travel lower in the sky. So during the time, what will happen is that the sun will change declination. So this is you, this is where your zenith is, this is where the north celestial pole is, for instance. So what we'll have is that the sun on March 21st and September 21st, so during the vernal equinox, the sun will travel exactly on the direction here. If you start the 21st of March, it will travel under and that heights here. Then in April, it will be higher. In May it will be higher, and in June it will be the highest in the sky, so this is the peak of the summer. And when the time is passing by, the path of the sun will go down in July here, then back in August, and then in uh, September it will cross again the equinox, and then it will be uh, lower in October, November, and December it will be the lower, so this is the, the peak of the winter, and then it will rise again, January, February, and March. So the path of the sun in our sky would change with time. And of course, if you're in the North Pole, what happens is that the equinox, the celestial equator, will be exactly on your horizon during the equinox in March and September. Then, at the 21st of June, it will be very high in the sky, 23.5 degrees, but it will turn almost on that day. It will do a full tour almost at the same height, so that means you will have 24 hours of day, light, but during the solstice of winter, then the sun will be below your horizon for the whole day, so you will have a full day of night. So this is what happened in, in cold Arctic regions, this is what happened exactly when you're in the North Pole, but when you're uh, south on, or north Arctic regions, uh, what happened is that your North Celestial Pole or South Celestial Pole is very high up in your sky. Solstice of, of summer, you will have the sun barely setting up and staying up the whole day. And uh, the solstice of winter, the, the sun will barely rise up. So this is why we call it the land of the midnight sun. 
is that if you go for very high up or very source down Arctic regions, when you will have the sun during one day, it will come from zenith down to the horizon, but won't set and go back again. So this is why we call them the land of the midnight sun. It means if you go to those uh, regions, you will have uh, for six months, so during summer, uh, almost daylight all the day. And uh, when I was in the UK, I was going very often to uh, uh, Scotland in Edinburgh. And over there, so it's quite north up, it's very close, actually it's north of Scotland, is in the Arctic region. And uh, 21st of uh, June, one evening, I was there uh, going out with friends in restaurants. I went out of the restaurants, it was something like 10 in the evening, and it was still daylight. So you can have daylight up to uh, 11, even midnight. On the other hand, if you are on the equator, what happens is that your day light, as I mentioned, will be all, almost always 12 hours per day. You always have 12 hours of daylight per day. Your day is split exactly into 12 hours. And this is independent, more or less, of the season. So what the only difference is, uh, so your uh, Senate will be here. So during the equinox, you will have, the uh, of March and September, you have the sun crossing exactly your meridian. So it will be very high. And uh, in uh, the, the summer and June, it will be a bit uh, louder. So uh, what will happen, what happened in, in the equator, is that you have uh, lots of light, lots of day light coming every day. So that's why it's very hot. Same thing for uh, the tropical uh, regions. So what we have is that your North Celestial Pole is very close to the horizon. So this is your meridian. So what we'll have is that during the summer, your sun is almost reaching the 90 degrees at the solstice sol summer. That means that you will have the sun going all the way around during the day, while during the solstice of winter, it will be a bit lower. But in the tropics, the, the sun is always very close to the zenith. It even reached the zenith at some point of the year. So there are lots of light heating coming from the sunlight throughout the year. So that's why it's very hot. So finally, uh, we'll come to a, a notion that is a, a, a bit more complex, but that's quite interesting effect. Is the fact that actually we have a precession of equinoxes. What does that mean? Is that I told you since the start that we have defined the celestial sphere with our North Celestial Pole and the South Celestial Pole and the North Celestial Pole corresponding to the Polaris star. Because this is corresponding to the rotation, axis of rotation of the Earth, the point of direction of the axis of rotation of the Earth on the sky. But what happened is that actually the Earth is not a perfect sphere. A perfect sphere. It's actually wobbling a bit, exactly like uh, you know those um, toys you're playing when you're a kid. You make it turn like that, and after a while, it's not perfectly perpendicular, and it starts wobbling in that direction. So what's happening in there is that the axis of rotation of the Earth is not completely fixed. It's actually also changing with time. So my Earth is rotating around the axis this way, but actually the axis itself is rotating in that direction. This is what is shown with this circle here. And we know that, for instance, in 14,000 years, the uh, North Celestial Pole won't be anymore Polaris, but it would be in Vega. So this wobble has a periodicity of around 26,000 years in time scale. So every 26,000 years is doing a full tour. So what you have here, this is the different position of the uh, North Celestial Pole with time compared. So here it's Polaris and uh, Vega would be around over there. Uh, this effect is resulting, uh, it's a result of the combined gravitational pull of the Sun and the Moon on the Earth together. It's making not the, uh, the Earth rotating, uh, axial rotation staying exactly the same, but make it wobble. So the angle of the axis of rotation compared to the plan of the rotation around the, uh, the Earth around the Sun is always the same with an angle of 23.5, but the position of the axis is actually changing with time. That's the idea. So the Vernon Equinox is now in, in Pisces, and 2,000 years ago it was in Aries, and uh, around 200,000 years from now it would be in Aquarius. That's why we are calling it the, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. So these are the different positions of the celestial pole with time. Polaris is here at 2,000 
100 BC, and Vega is over there. So this is what we call the precession. We'll, we'll come back on this effect of precession when we'll talk about the Earth in more details, because this may have an impact of uh, climate change. But this is also uh, to show you that this tessile sphere that I told you is fixed, is fixed for a short period of time. There are things that are a bit more complicated as well, like actually stars have proper, have proper motion, so their position at Celsius sphere also would change with time. So uh, it, there are extra complications, but this is more or less the way we are looking at our sky uh, today. And I uh, showed you some coordinates system. This is the Alta system. And the main problem with this Alta system is actually that it changes with time and uh, place. That means where you are on the Earth, you will have a different sky. Okay, your zenith won't be the same in Taiwan than the zenith in uh, Sao Paulo, for instance. And uh, so this Alta system is very efficient when you use it for observation locally, but actually it won't work globally. So we need to come up with a, another system, and this is called the uh, Redex system, and I'll describe it to you a bit more in details. So this is the end of the lecture of today, and uh, thank you for your attention.